Hi, everyone. I want to get us started just to be respectful of everybody's time this afternoon. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Caitlin Clarkson Pereira, and I am the executive director of GVpedia. And thanks so much for joining us today to learn more about the gun-free zone myth. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin today. All guests in here are on mute. Some of you submitted questions uh, with your RSVP form. We have some of those put aside to ask. You can also throw questions in the chat as they come up during the presentation, uh, or we tend to spend the last half an hour or so answering questions, which sometimes lead to people asking more questions. So we'll certainly take time to, uh, to go through any of those questions that you might have. And this is on uh, record, so just throwing that out there. And in a minute, I'm going to introduce Devin to everybody. But first, I wanted to give a brief introduction of who we are. GVpedia is a comprehensive resource providing public access to our gun study database, which is the largest in existence, and access to GVP University, which is a repository of white papers and fact sheets about gun violence. Both the database and the university are easily searchable by subject matter and provide an excellent resource for educational and advocacy purposes. GVP University is also home to our Facts About Firearms Policy Initiative, the Firehose of Falsehood, and our newly launched data visualization. So now I'm going to turn this over to Devin Hughes, who's the founder of GVpedia, to take a further look with us at the gun-free zone myth. This is a topic we have covered in some ways before, but because it's one that the gun lobby is constantly using to garner support, we wanted to be sure to share some more details that Devin has come across and that are important to be aware of. So Devin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to try to hop right into it and share my screen and see if I can start the presentation. Beginning. Perfect. So today we're going to be talking about the gun-free zone myth and more specifically the main data point behind. So first, I'm going to cover briefly what are gun-free zones, because there's no one set definition, and what are mass shootings, because there's also there no one set definition. Um, then I'm going to explain what the gun-free zone myth is and how it came about, and then go directly into the data fraud that we've uncovered over the past several years. Then I'm going to talk about the failure of fact checkers who have looked at this specific claim and have not uncovered what we have. And then towards the end, explain like what does the real data actually show? How does the gun-free zone myth interact with other myths? And finally, why does all of this matter? Because at the outset, it might seem like just a specific nitpicky point about a single talking point, but it's much more than that. And so that's a brief overview of where we're going to be going over the next 25 or so minutes. So first, what are gun-free zones and mass shootings? And this is going to be how John Lott defines these for his own work. And for the most part, towards the end, we're going to um, question these definitions. But at the outset, we're just going to accept them at face value. So a gun-free zone is loosely where civilians are prohibited from carrying guns. However, it gets more specific, particularly with John Lott, where he includes areas where it is difficult for civilians to carry guns. Um, what does Lott consider difficult areas? Basically, whatever's convenient. So he will basically count all of New York State to functionally be a gun-free zone. Same with states like California or Massachusetts, um, which is definitely a choice that can be made, um, but it's how he presents his data. And then also he does not count armed guards or police officers being present when there is a shooting 
to count as areas where guns are allowed. He still counts areas with armed guards as gun-free zones, which again is a choice one can make and we'll circle back to that towards the end. In terms of how he defines mass shooting, he uses the four or more dead definition in incident. The incident needs to be in public, so he does not count um, shootings that occur in private residences or what he considers private property. Um, the shooting cannot be in commission of another crime. So let's say there's a mass shooting that results from a um, robbery. That would not be counted according to these rules. Also, no gang shootings or drug-related shootings are counted under this. And as you probably know, this is substantially different from gun violence archives definition, which uses the four or more people shot definition and does not exclude um, private residences, gang-related shootings, shootings that emerge from another crime. They provide different labels for all those shootings, but they still count them as mass shootings, whereas John Lott does not. And for the purposes of this data, we're sticking with John Lott's definitions until we explore them a bit, a bit more detail towards the end. So what is the gun-free zone? This is the myth that mass shooters deliberately and overwhelmingly target areas where people can't carry, carry guns. And this is based on the theory of indirect deterrence, where mass shooters may be deterred by somebody shooting back at them. And so they deliberately target places where they know the risk of somebody shooting back at them is going to be minimal. And so the idea goes that they will be able to maximize the death toll in their shootings. And this has more broadly been adopted by pro-gun advocates with the meme that shows there where it's basically fish in a barrel. They see any area where guns are not allowed as just easy targets for mass shooters and mass shooters will target those. So where does the gun-free zone myth originate? The idea of indirect deterrence has been around for quite a while, but John Lott was one of the first, if not the first, to apply it to the debate around guns and gun laws. Um, in the early 1990s, you had the original gun-free zone bills come up that designated schools as gun-free zones, and those passed overwhelmingly. Like you had a hundred something House members not even show up for the vote because it was so un uncontroversial. And even in the wake of the Columbine shooting, you had the NRA's former Vice President Wayne LaPierre basically reiterate that they believed in 100% gun-free zone schools. Now, he kept the door open for armed guards, but that's a long way from where we are now, where basically all sorts of places are being... Uh, there's lots of legislation out there pushing for guns to be allowed essentially everywhere. And the specific talking point we're going to be going into is that since 2014, John Lott has claimed that between 94 to 98 percent of mass shootings since from 1950 to the present day have occurred in gun-free zones. His initial talking point was 98 percent, and that's been revised down to 94 percent over the years, and we'll get to those revisions as we go through this. And Lott claims that mass shooters target such areas because they know they won't face armed resistance. And when asked to supply evidence for his claim, he points to his own website and data sheets that he claims support his assertions. He challenges others to be just as transparent. So back in 2019, um, GVpedia was entering its second year of existence at that point, I decided to take up the challenge of looking at John Lott's own data sheets. And this was prompted by something Dr. Louis Clarivas said in a lecture for Johns Hopkins and an online course they were holding where he found the numbers to be suspicious. And as I knew Lott provided the data on his own website, I went ahead and looked. And what I found was that for 
the period of 1977 to 1997, so for 20 years of data, Lott was counting each individual death in a mass shooting as the entire mass shooting itself. And this period is crucial because a lot of states during that time did not allow or did not have right to carry laws. If a state does not have a right to carry law, Lott basically counts that entire state as a gun-free zone. And so this greatly artificially increased the number of shootings that Lot said were occurring in gun-free zones and reducing the percentage that were not occurring in such zones. And the example that really caught my eye in this was on his own spreadsheet, he indicated that there were 14 mass shootings in Oklahoma in 1986. Well, I'm from Oklahoma. And I know for a fact that there were not 14 mass shootings in Oklahoma that year where four or more people died. There was one mass shooting in which 14 people died. And this applied to the overwhelming majority of cases or mass shootings they claimed during that period. And so his initial web sheet was showing from 1950 to 1976, seven shootings. From 1977 to 97, 247 mass shootings. And then from 1998 to 2018, 66 mass shootings. When I uncovered this data error and wrote an article about it, um, Lot initially denied that there was an error. And then four days later, the numbers on his spreadsheet changed to where from 50 to 76, so still seven shootings. From 1998 to 2018, there are now 74 shootings. But from 1977 to 97, there were 50 shootings. So this was basically an admission that, yes, there was an error in his own spreadsheets, because otherwise you do not change the number of mass shootings you claim from 247 down to 50. And his claimed percentage of mass shootings went from 98% to 94%. And Lot claimed that this was just due to uh, mass shooting, more mass shootings occurring over time and causing the percentage to change. But the overwhelming main reason for this change in which the number of shootings that occurred in areas that allow guns tripled was due to this data error. And at that point, I felt that the story probably ended there. There was a massive error. It was impossible to prove whether it was intentional or not. It could have just been sloppiness. Um, and so I felt, well, that number changed. Until 2022, where he issued an update to his numbers. And he now claimed that the number of mass shootings in gun-free zones had increased to 96% of cases. Despite his underlying data showing that there is a substantial decrease in the percentage of shootings that occurred in gun-free zones, because there's a lot more shootings occurring in areas that allowed guns and more areas that were allowing guns. And I went ahead and checked the math. And as it turns out, Lot reintroduced the error that GVpedia identified in 2019. He was once again claiming there were 247 mass shootings from 1977 to 1997. And we provide archived versions of all of Lot's data and web pages. So you can freely double check us on this. And you can double check the map. And it will show with his 2022 data set that 13 divided by 145, 13 being the number of mass shootings he claimed occurred in areas that allow guns, would be 9%. Whereas what he was actually claiming with the 96% is 13 divided by 342. And so the very numbers themselves prove that Lot was going back to the original error. And this error has continued to persist in Lot's updates in 2023 and 2024. And the math shows that while Lot currently claims 94% of 
mass shootings occur in gun-free zones since 1950. According his, uh, to his own data and taking his own data at face value, it should be 89%, so nearly double the number of cases that occur in areas that allow guns. So to provide a brief overview of the timeline here, um, because there's a lot of numbers floating about in this, from 2014 to 2019, Locke claimed 98% of mass shootings occurred in gun-free zones. In 2019, we found that Lot was counting individual mass shooting fatalities for a 20 year period as entire mass shootings. Four days after we released this report, Lot changed the number of mass shootings from that period from 247 to 50. When he did this, he claimed there was never an error in multiple public statements and falsely accused us of making stuff up multiple times in public. And then in 2022 to the present day, Lot once again counts individual mass shooting fatalities from that period as entire mass shootings. And the reason this occurs is because Lot's error artificially boosts the claim percentage of mass shootings occurring in gun-free zones. It's a lot more convenient and powerful for Lot to say 94% rather than 89% or a lower figure. And this is a pretty clear cut case of fraud, both in terms of academic fraud and the legal definition of fraud. Under academic fraud, there's a variety of definitions out there from schools, but one of the simpler ones was from the University of Virginia Honor Committee, which talks about false data, which is the fabrication or alteration of data to deliberately mislead. For example, changing data to get better experiment results is academic fraud. And then I'm not going to read through the entire civil fraud case, but it's basically making a false statement of fact that was either intentional misrepresentation or was extremely reckless towards the truth. And in this case, the evidence clearly shows that Lot knew there was an error. Otherwise, he would not have corrected that error. And then the error was reintroduced. And all the while he's making public denials that there is ever such an error. So that goes a long ways in showing intent. And this specific pattern of the data indicates that like this wasn't simply a mistake. Like you don't make that sort of correction and then reintroduce the error. And on top of this, even if you remove the explicit data fraud, which changes it from 94% to 89%, he's still very much incorrect on his other data points. So for example, he counts the shootings in Buffalo, New York, Allen, Texas, Hialeah, Florida, and Umpqua, Oregon, as occurring in gun-free zones when the overwhelming evidence indicates that they're not. For example, in Buffalo, New York, um, people are allowed to carry at the supermarket. There's an armed guard there who engaged the shooter in gunfire and the shooter fully expected in his manifesto to encounter people concealed carrying firearms. With Allen, Texas, Lot simply gets the um, laws around gun-free zone signs in Texas incorrect. Um, Texas law has changed to such where there are no real gun-free zones for private businesses anymore. And this was pointed out to him by a number of people who had carried in that mall, and there were people carrying there at the time. Uh, Umqua was um, shooting at a community college and the community college itself has come out with an explicit statement saying that they were not a gun-free zone at the time. And um, also there were students carrying at the time of the shooting. And then Highway of Florida was a shooting that occurred at a restaurant that Lot falsely classifies as a bar. And these are just the highest level mistakes we found. He also counts cases where there were gun battles that occurred, either with civilians, um, firing back guns at 
the shooter or armed police or armed guards that were there at the time. And this was the case with the University of Texas mass shooting. Um, there was a case in Parkland, Washington, where all four of the fatalities were armed police officers. There's a Washington Naval Yard where the shooter engaged multiple agents in gun battles, in fact, armed himself with a handgun from one of the agents during the shooting. And the Orlando, Florida Pulse nightclub shooting, where there was an armed guard who engaged the shooter in a gunfight before the shooter entered the place. And he also excludes a number of mass shootings um, for false reasons. For example, in Mount Terry, North Carolina, he claims it was a gang shooting. While that was just a rumor at the time and future evidence showed that wasn't the case. There's um, shootings in open spaces in Skagit County, Washington, Geneva County, Al County, Alabama, Odessa, Texas, and Meteor, Washington, where some of the shooting occurred in private residences and then some occurred in public. But because some occurred in private residence, lot doesn't count it as a mass shooting. Or with Odessa, Texas, because the shooter was driving while he was shooting, and so the shooting occurred over multiple specific locations, lot doesn't count it as a mass shooting. And just a variety of weird definitional choices and false conclusions that um, really cast all of the data into question um, outside of just the specific case of data fraud. So it's not just fraud, he's also extremely incorrect. And these are just the surface level cases that are extremely easy to prove. Um, Lott also includes cases in his spreadsheet that are labeled as question marks that are pretty clearly in areas that allowed guns, but labeling them, labeling them as question marks means they don't impact the toll. And there's just dozens upon dozens of these cases that come up. And despite all the errors, though, it's still a very popular myth. Um, back in 2018, when uh, Trump was at the NRA convention in Dallas, which we're going to be seeing a repeat of in a couple of days, um, he included in his speech that 98% of mass public shootings have occurred in places where guns are banned. And because of the high profile nature of this statement and other lawmakers making statements about this, um, the Washington Post, factcheck.org, PolitiFact, the Associated Press, and AZ Central have all conducted fact checks of this statement. And in every single case, none of them looked at lot spreadsheets where the error can be found. And all of these cases found like a couple examples where shootings were incorrectly categorized but they would end their analysis with the statement that this was half true or some equivalent of half true. And this is kind of staggering because we, the general public, rely on fact checkers to actually check the data that they are fact checking. And all they had to do was open one spreadsheet, scroll down, and see what the numbers were and that they didn't add up. And they didn't. And two of these fact checks, the one by the Associated Press and one by AZ Central, occurred after our initial 2019 report on gun free zones. So the accurate information explaining why this data was false was out there, but they didn't check. And I even contacted one of them, I won't say which one, about this. And they indicated that, yeah, the data appears to be slightly more fraught or have bigger problems, but because the piece has already been released, we're not going to do anything about it. And this has been rather disheartening, a rather disheartening look at the fact-checking industry of sorts. So what are the facts? And part of the issue with the gun-free zone myth is that there is no set definition of gun-free zone or mass shooting. 
and which mass shootings you include and which areas you count as gun-free zones make a substantial difference in terms of the numbers. So there was peer-reviewed work by uh, Dr. Louis Clarivas that found that 84% of mass shootings or high fatality rampage shootings in his case, which is six or more deaths, occurred in areas that allow firearms. And then there is another 4% that occurred in areas where there is police or armed security present. And so overall, there's like 16% that could be considered gun-free zones there. But if you loosen the definite or change the definitions to like what Lot has specifically, once you correct all the mistakes in Lot's piece, you're probably going to get somewhere around 60% that occur in gun-free zones. Once you adjust for like not counting gun battles as occurring in gun-free zones. And... So 16 to 60% is a very wide range. And we just currently don't know what the exact percentage is in that range. And also because the entire concept of gun-free zones is rather questionable at best, given the proliferation of people carrying firearms. Um, you have police can carry firearms everywhere. There's lots of places with armed security. And mass shooters know that there's going to be a heavily armed response to their shootings coming. Like they know this is very likely to be their last act and yet they still aren't deterred by it. And there's other cases where a business will say it's a gun-free zone like the Aur Aurora Theater shooting which had an explicit policy saying, don't carry guns here. Yet, as confirmed by survivors from that shooting and the city manager at the time, there were still people in that audience carrying firearms and did not help. Them. And so is that does that count as a gun-free zone or not? And that is the subject of a lot of potential academic debate. So the exact figure is not known, but what we do know is that the claims of 90% or more occurring in gun-free zones are very much false in the product of data fraud. And it would be excellent if academics did a deeper audit of lots numbers. I was going through um, the numbers myself from 1977 to 97, and there's clearly cases that were missing and other cases that likely didn't happen. But it was extremely difficult to prove which were which. And it was just a massive data mess as well. So we went ahead and released what we were definitively certain of, which was these particular false numbers and why they were false. And the reason the gun-free zone myth matters is that it's a foundational part of a larger architecture. Over the past five decades, the gun lobby has been pushing a fire hose of falsehood campaign to convince people that guns make us safer. And there's four key myths bolstering that central claim. One is on defensive gun use. There's more guns, less crime. There's the idea that gun laws don't work. And there's this idea that mass shooters target gun free zones. And so this is a foundational aspect of the core myth. And it also relates to these other myths. So with widespread defensive gun use, um, the gun-free zone point indicates that regular armed deterrence is necessary for um, shooters to instead target gun-free zones, but we know that to not be the case. Um, with more guns, less Crime, indirect deterrence requires shooters to avoid areas with armed resistance, yet the evidence is not there. And then with the idea of gun laws don't work, um, if shooters target areas with fewer guns, any laws that restrict gun ownership would be counterproductive. So the gun-free zone myth informs these other three myths as well, as well as the larger idea that guns make us safer. And the reason this matters is that one truth sh should matter. And there's a large portion, a, a large number of pro-gun advocates and their allies out there 
who pushed this narrative. So the NRA, Gun Owners of America, Heritage Foundation, and other right-wing think tanks have all pushed out this information. It's an integral part of the fire hose of falsehood, like I mentioned. This is used in amicus briefs and testimony in front of court. So the Ninth Circuit is currently hearing a case where this number is explicitly cited in an amicus brief filed by Don Lott's organization. It's also used in testimony to state houses and likely federal testimony as well. And it's influencing federal legislation. It's being cited to support bills that have already passed in Arkansas, Missouri, and Wyoming, and most recently a bill to arm teachers in Tennessee. It all stems back to this original core myth. And it's also been heavily cited by um, Kentucky Representative Thomas Massey when introducing federal les legislation to end gun-free zones, particularly in schools. And also, unfortunately, it, it appears that the public is buying into this myth as well, as the number of record gun sales over the past several years have shown. While we're below the um, pandemic peak back in 2020 and 2021, there's still around 2.7 million guns that were sold then and around 2 million being sold currently. Further, more than six in 10 Americans believe that a firearm in the home makes them safer and 56% believe that more people carrying concealed firearms would make the country safer. And particularly with the public part, um, to stop mass shooters. And that stems back to this myth as well. So you can learn more about this on gvpedia.org or on our recent article that we released on armedwithreason.substack.com. And we have our social media handles at the bottom. And so with no further ado, happy to answer any and all questions. Thanks so much, Devin. I do have a couple questions that were submitted here in the RSVP form, of course, as I said at the opening, if anybody has any questions they wanna throw into the chat, please feel free to do so. But the first question we're going to ask today is how can you identify false data? Yeah, so identifying false data can be somewhat challenging and fortunately, um, we can't rely on fact checkers to always find it. And so the initial part is always, does this pass the smell test? Does this make sense? And what prompted me to pursue um, looking at this data was Dr. Louis Clarabas basically saying that this data does not make sense. And when I had that sort of confirmation, I decided to delve deeper into the data and specifically into the period from 1977 to 97. And the data here is inherently suspicious as well, because for all of the other points that Lot was making, he was citing specific mass shootings, where they occurred, when they occurred, how many casualties and like news links and stuff like that. So you could easily verify the cases he was talking about, even if like the conclusions he was drawing was incorrect. The underlying data was there. Whereas for this period, all he provided was the year, the state, and then the claimed number of mass shootings during that period. And it was, which is not much to go off of, particularly when you're looking for data from more than 25 or 25 plus years ago and trying to find news clippings and such. But when you can see some of the more egregious cases, for example, o claiming Oklahoma had 14 men shootings in one period, like if that was the case, somebody would have noticed. And when you then look that up and find, oh, there's one mass shooting in which 14 or more people died, that can lead you to check other cases and quickly verify that, oh, there's a pattern here that extends beyond just this particular case. And so it really starts at like seeing something does not add up 
then looking and trying to verify the data and basically doing your own research as it were, or like um, messaging an academic or an organization saying like, hey, there's this particular bit of data. This does not seem to add up. Can you take a look at it as well? And relying on those sort of deeper dives. And this can also be the case in stuff like the defensive gun use myth, where the pro-gun side says that there's around 2.5 million defensive gun uses annually. And yet when you look at the empirical data that's collected by the gun violence archive, they find fewer than 2000 verified defensive gun uses. Something does not add up there. And so that can lead to you looking into the research around surveys and the potential problems they have. And so really it all starts from the initial feeling that this doesn't make sense, something's not right here. And then following that instinct and finding more information about it. But unfortunately there's no like easy button that you can push and be like, is this true or false? Um, it requires deeper research. And one of the core parts of GVPD's mission is to make that research much more readily accessible and to try to generate fact sheets and easy to consume content that debunks the major myths and kind of takes the need for like days of Google searching. We've already done that, <laughs> that for you basically in compiling it all in one spot to counter these myths. I'm afraid this is probably beyond our scope of practice because I think I know the answer, but how do we get public health considerations back into court decisions about Second Amendment cases? Yeah, so the only real way there is for future Supreme Courts that have a different composition from this current Supreme Court to look back over particularly the Second Amendment cases and realize this does not make sense and to basically overturn um, not only DC versus Heller, but more importantly, um, the Bruin case, which basically threw out any public health considerations and explicitly stated the only things that matter are, were there laws in the 1800s or earlier that look similar to this law, which again, is not a great approach for anything, but sadly outside of GVPD's purview where, yeah, it's just going to require a different court and that's, and waiting for that different court in the future to re-allow public health data to um, actually influence decisions on public safety. Devin, can you talk about what the data shows regarding concealed carry and campus shootings? Yeah, so unfortunately, there's not a lot of data out there, largely because um, most schools still don't allow campus carry. And so the, those that do are a distinct minority of colleges and have a relatively low um, population of students, though, unfortunately, more and more schools are going this route. Um, and shootings at schools in general are statistically rare and particularly higher universities. If you look at cases that occur on universities versus those that occur just off campus or in this town city um, that the university is located in or next to, you'll consistently find that the campus is safer than there. And so there aren't all that many cases to draw on to form a statistical analysis for that specific case. Now, what the research does tell us is that the move of allowing even more concealed carry in more places across the country, and particularly the dramatic shift from states not allowing concealed carry or having may issue licenses going to right to carry licenses 
shows that there's a substantial increase in violent crimes, um, particularly aggravated assault, some increase in homicides from that sort of move. So while the specific direct data is limited, there's a lot of data surrounding it suggesting that it's not a good idea to have campus carry. And fortunately, more and more states are moving in that direction. What do you think is the most effective data-based messaging to for us to disseminate to our supporters? Um, so <laughs> a relatively broad question, but I do feel that um, myth busting in particular is essential. Um, simply putting out the facts and then having the gun lobby and its allies put out their falsehoods, um, they typically tend to cancel each other out. And that's what a lot of the research on persuasion finds, is that simply raising awareness and putting facts out there is not sufficient. You have to be able to look at what the gun lobby and its allies are saying and explain succinctly hey, this talking point you're likely to encounter is false. Here's why it's false. And here's what the true facts are. And um, in the academic literature, this is what's called inoculation, where you treat disinformation as a virus and the antidote to that virus is a vaccine, in this case, an informational vaccine, where you prepare somebody's um, fact-based immune system, as it were, for encountering the disinformation virus by sort of showing it beforehand and explaining why it's incorrect. And then people are more resistant to that disinformation-based um, propaganda, as it were. And so I think that's the core messaging and foundation, something that and gun violence prevention needs to work on is countering these myths and not simply ignoring them or assuming, oh, that let's say John Mott's been debunked so many times before nobody listens to him or Gary Kleck or somebody else. And like with John Mott in particular, it's like, it, it would be fantastic if nobody was listening to his disinformation. Like he was, he left academia two decades ago. Like his work should not be academically influential, yet it's being cited in court cases. It's being used in amicus briefs. It's being used as the justification for laws across the country. Like this disinformation is extremely influential. And until we push back on it hard enough, it's going to stay influential. It's not something we can ignore and it will go away on its own. Otherwise, it would have gone gone away on its own two decades ago. We have a question here in the chat uh, wondering if GVpedia is reaching out to media fact checkers to have them cite us for this data that we're collecting. Um, we have had some communications with fact checkers. Um, there's been a relative dearth of um, gun violence related fact checks over the past six months or so uh, since the uh, mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine. Um, there hasn't been another shooting that's captured national attention for more than a day or two. And that's typically when fact checkers um, get involved in the gun violence discussion is when there's a high profile incident and a lot of people, high profile people spreading disinformation out there. I mean, the original fact checks to Lot's piece by uh, PolitiFact and the Washington Post came because Donald Trump mentioned the number during the NRA convention. And now it's quite possible that he would, he could do so again. Um, 
this here in a few days. And there might be an opportunity there to conduct further outreach, particularly if outlets share their previous fact checks on this. But unfortunately, in that sort of private messaging, there's just the attention of fact checkers is too thinly spread, understandably. There's a lot of other subjects other than gun violence that they have to focus on every once in a while. And so unless there's a specific event that draws their attention back to this issue, um, their time is being spent elsewhere. And there's definitely a hesitation to go back to fact checks that occurred years ago at this point and revise them. Like I got resistance from the person who put out one of the fact checks after we contacted them. And that was two to three days after. I was like, oh, well, we've already published it and we've kind of moved on. And that's just an unfortunate reality that we're going to face, particularly with the fact checking industry that um, unless you get have basically already done the debunking work and have everything ready to go and an easy to access email <laughs> that you can send them the instant after somebody says something and they happen to be checking that thing, um, you basically have to rely on the contacts that they already have um, knowing about the specific data and being able to refute it in a specific way. But unfortunately, in the gun-free zone case, a lot of academics, like, they don't take lot seriously, which is understandable from an academic point of view. And like lots very rarely able to publish in journals any for understandable reasons. But the universe extends beyond peer reviewed journals. There's the court cases, legislation, and then just the public discussion that's occurring on these issues that's also important. And unfortunately just does not have backstop. And one of the core missions of GDP is to try to get this information out there as much as possible for people to share and counter disinformation regularly. And then through that process, um, fact checkers and others should begin to notice. But we have been doing outreach, but our profile is still relatively small. Like we are a small nonprofit um, with a limited budget and limited time. And we're trying to push the message out there, but it requires assistance from others for our message to be heard as scale to where it will have a substantial impact. So we're doing the outreach, but we're always looking for assistance in promoting the facts on these cases. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. The beauty of the gun violence prevention movement is that there are quite a few of us who are participating in making sure that this country becomes a safer place. And the myth busting that unfortunately we have to do is only as valuable as far of the, as the reach that it has. Yeah. So, I mean, if you myth bust in the internet and nobody's in that corner of the internet, did you actually myth? Did bust? you actually? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a philosophical question is all this time. And right. I have on that before the next question. Um, we have covered the gun-free zone myth previously, like we did back in 2019. And then we had a GBPD Explains, I think it was back in 2021 during the pandemic. Um, the reason we're doing this again is this time we're able to demonstrate the fraud, that it's not, it's more than just a mistake. It's more than just conflicting definitions. It's more than like a he said, he said sort of situation. Like we have the tangible evidence there that there was an error. Lot knew there was an error, covertly corrected it, claimed there was never a correction, 
and then he reintroduced it. And that's a fact pattern, even in all the massive number of disinformation cases out there and false talking points, that is rare. It's rare where you can pretty confidently show intent in a certain case. And also where there's that intent, and then it's being used in court cases ongoing right now. It's a rare combination and potentially an opportunity for there to be actual consequences for this falsehood. Because in the past, I've seen so many cases of what would what should amount to perjury. And courts don't particularly care if it's an expert witness. It's like, oh, it's this expert's word versus this expert's word. And they don't have the time or necessarily skill set to delve into the weeds to find out who's correct. So it just moves on. And but in this case, there's an identifiable fact pattern that could result in something. And so that's why we're readdressing this point and why I feel this particular case is so important because the evidence is so clear here and relatively unique out of all the other cases of disinformation. Uh, in the chat, Eric, who is our senior editor of Armed with Reason, which is the GVpedia substack, has left a couple of links. One will actually take you to our Substack, and it references the uh, post that Devin was speaking about that published was published yesterday. So feel free to check that out. And Devin, I actually don't have any more questions for you here. So if you have a final thought, feel free to share it. Uh, but if not, we can certainly let everybody go on on their way. Yeah, so I'll just put in a shameless plug at the end. Um, as mentioned, GBPD is a small nonprofit, and we're looking to expand to where we can more effectively counter disinformation and put the facts out there in a coherent um, and digestible way. And those efforts really do rely on your support as well. So if you haven't already subscribed to our Armed with Reason Substack, please do so. If you have subscribed, please consider doing a paid subscription for the cost of a Starbucks coffee. I think it's a Starbucks coffee. Who knows with inflation <laughs> at this point. Um, Starbucks coffee per month like helps us. It helps us put out more of this content. It helps us develop our plans and further integrate all the aspects of GVpedia into um, future plans and the ability to create a structure that can help all organizations and individuals out there looking to make a difference on gun violence. So with that shameless plug out of the way, um, yeah, just thank you so much. Oh, and I think there is a question that came in. Uh, someone had a question about one of the larger organizations taking on a fraud suit uh but that would be for the attorneys to discern whether that was <laughs> possible for them to do or not yeah yeah and I, i'm not sure if the giffords person is still on here but like that's the realm of lawyers like i am not a lawyer um thankfully <laughs> <laughs> um but like we're definitely pushing the material and the evidence to those who are interested and could potentially do something about it. We don't know if anything will stem from this. Um, like it would be great if this advanced further, but yeah, we're ex actively exploring avenues of trying to get this information into hands where it can make a substantial difference. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you to everybody for coming today. I will send an email out before the week is over with a, a link to the piece that ran yesterday about this topic and a recording of this. And then 
you can certainly feel free to send me an email back if you have any questions or if you would like us to present this to anybody else, any other organizations that you work with. That is certainly our goal to be able to do things like that to help spread the word. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.